to me during a test docking. I spent my entire life expanding my mind with the educational programs and astronomy news reports on the telly, collecting astronomy books and newspaper clippings. I witnessed the impact of Shoemaker Levy 9, the Galileo atmospheric entry, and the Pathfinder landing. I even savoured this full-page article from the Sun Herald, printed around the time the Pathfinder touched down. My dream was to one day be the first man on Mars, but then I learned of the Apollo moon hoax. My life changed after that. It became clear to me that there are certain things that you can look but not touch. Years later, I saw the reports of NASA's next missions to Mars, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. Whilst watching these news reports, a strange thing happened. On January 21st, the Spirit rover's signal abruptly ceased. The next day, it was back again and sending pictures from the surface. Looking at these shots, I couldn't help but notice the terrain's striking similarities to the Australian desert. At the time, I wondered, what if? What if when NASA lost contact with Spirit, they substituted the lost data with fake footage that they shot in some Aussie's backyard? Remember, it was the Australian tracking stations who lost the signal. The 1978 motion picture, Capricorn One, was based largely on Bill Casing's book proposing that the moon landings were actually filmed on Earth. Only the fictional Capricorn One crew was faking a manned flight to Mars, rather than the moon. I take this step in the journey of peace for all mankind. Hey, Slomo. I am on the surface. Roger, Capricorn. We copy. I'm Some three years on. prior to the movie, Viking 1 had already become NASA's first unmanned Mars lander. Ironically, it seems that the faker Capricorn 1 landing and the real-life Viking 1, along with all other Mars landings after it, are not so different. Long before I had my suspicions, Ralph René had already come to the conclusion that NASA had never landed a craft on Mars. To start with, both the planets Earth and Mars have their own atmosphere. But both are structured very differently. According to Wikipedia, the Martian atmosphere is very thin and varies in air pressure. At the peak of Olympus Mons, a volcano three times as tall as Everest, the atmospheric pressure is as low as 0.0043 psi. In the pit of Hellas Planitia, the largest crater on Mars, the air pressure is 0.16 psi. Whereas the surface level pressure is 0.087 psi. By comparison, our own planet's atmosphere has a sea level pressure of 14.7 psi. But, the higher one ascends into the air, the denser the atmosphere becomes. On this Earth, if you jump out of a plane too high and pull your chute too soon, that chute will wrap itself up and will never deploy. I called up the sky jumpers when I started thinking along these lines. And I can't, let, let me think. Let me think how high. Well, I think you got to be below 15,000 feet. Okay, or that you just ain't got enough air pressure to make it open up. To verify Renee's statement, I emailed Sydney skydivers to ask how high one can ascend before a chute would stream and fail to fill up. Their prompt response confirmed what Renee had said. Normal jump height for skydivers is 14,000 feet. Up to this, height is not an issue. First of all, Mars has a very, very slender atmosphere. It's one-tenth of a percent of the surface pressure here on Earth. 
one tenth of a percent is about equivalent to 120,000 feet up. There is no way that you could open a parachute up there. And if you did, it wouldn't mean anything. It would fall just like the feather falls in the vacuum chamber. So how in the hell are you parachuting that load down to the surface of that planet? Which is what they claim they've done each time. Uh, you know, it's a matter of straightforward physics. You can't do it here on Earth. You can't do it there on Mars. Okay, and even if you did open it, at that kind of pressure, what kind of resistance? Would it hold up 10 pounds or 2 pounds or an ounce? Even if you could get it open, how much would it hold up? In 1975, NASA launched its first of two landing probes, Vikings 1 and 2. Both landing probes weighed 572 kilograms, which is 1,261 pounds. After the lander was detached, rockets were used to slow it down to 560 miles an hour at an altitude of 800,000 feet. Then it was allowed to fall 781,000 feet under Martian gravity before a parachute was deployed at 19,000 feet. At 4,600 feet, this chute was detached and NASA tells us that it had a velocity of 145 miles an hour. Then rocket engines under computer control landed it. Mm -hmm. Why don't I believe one word there? It is losing it. The terminal velocity at the time the chute was deployed was about 4,300 feet per second, 3,000 miles an hour, which is faster than a speeding bullet. And in a matter of 14,000 feet, that the chute operating on the near vacuum conditions reduced the lander's speed to 145 miles an hour. Then the next probe was a 97. Remember that one? Yeah. Finder. It came in at 16,600 mph, was jettisoned to plunge boldly into the fringes of the Martin atmosphere without using retro rocket sensor orbit. As usual, there were two different histories given by NASA. The first stage that by some miracle, during the next minute, its speed was reduced to 1,000 miles an hour. The second stage that it was jettisoned at 5,300 miles and its speed was reduced in 30 minutes while it fell to 80 miles. Mm -hmm. The, the, the first case, the, the acceleration would have been incredible. In the second case, it would be 80 miles high while still doing 4,280 miles an hour. So they can't even get these stories straight. The man in charge of the cameras installed on the Martian probes was Michael C. Mallon of Mallon Space Science Systems Incorporated. He was among the scientists who observed the Pathfinder surface images as they were beamed down to Earth. Around the time of the Pathfinder landing, Ralph René picked up on an article by Richard A. Kerr entitled, Pathfinder Strikes a Rocky Bonanza. The article was published in the July 11th, 1997 issue of Science, a magazine published by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In this article, one comes across the following statement regarding Mallon's role in the Pathfinder project. Once he gets some sleep, after 24 hours of watching the images come down from Pathfinder and planning the next round of activities, he expects to calculate just how catastrophic the flood would have been. Note the words 24 hours of watching images come down from Pathfinder. They had this thing, the TV, going on 24 hours a day. You realize that? You can't do that either. Unless you've got three satellites up uh, going around Mars. Because Mars rotates, we rotate, and if you're not line of sight, how the hell do you get the data here? You got the picture? Yeah, I had the picture. In fact, I, I remember reading that they lost communication with Louisville and, and, and the other astronauts when they went behind the moon on Apollo 8. Uh -huh. But here on Mars, it was 24 hours a day. And we can prove that there were no geostationary satellites to relay the data back to Earth. Mariner 9 was turned off in 1972. NASA has been out of contact with the Viking 1 orbiter since 1980 and Viking 2 since 1978. The same is true with Russia's respective orbiters from their Mars and Phobos programs. Interestingly, the Soviet landing crafts dropped by Mars 2, 3 and 6 
were all to land on the red planet using parachutes. The Mars 2 lander crashed to the ground, and although officially Mars 3 made a soft touchdown, it didn't last longer than 20 seconds.